Up next, some historic sites with the name Monocacy. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to another edition of Paths to the Present. I'm your host, Gail Street. I'm here at the confluence of the Potomac and Monocacy Rivers, just over the county line in Frederick. It's a beautiful out of the way spot that draws boaters and hikers alike. There's a lot to see and do in this quadrant of the county, and we're going to explore two of them today. We'll start with a visit to the newly restored Monocacy Aqueduct. This 516 foot structure was completed in 1833 and is an important link along the CNO Canal. Later, we'll stop by the Monocacy Cemetery, which houses a chapel that memorializes Confederate soldiers who are buried there. But first, I have a history mystery for you. Do you know what caused these? These notches can be found on the iron railing of the Monocacy Aqueduct. Since the rest of the railing is notch-free, something must have caused them. Think you know what it is? Stay tuned. I'll give you the answer at the end of the show. In the early 1800s, the United States was expanding in size. With that came the need for improved transportation networks. Back then, one of the most cost-effective ways to move goods was by water. More could be hauled with less effort as long as the water flowed in the direction you wanted. That changed when the Erie Canal was completed in 1825, bringing economic prosperity to the Northeast. Its success sparked a canal building boom across the nation. The first half of the 1800s is when the majority of the canals in this country were built. Here in Maryland, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal Company broke ground in 1828. Engineer and historian Robert Kapsch worked on the feasibility study to restore the aqueduct for the National Park Service. Well, initially the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal was supposed to go to the Ohio River, to Pittsburgh. Uh, it never got that far and only the eastern division of three divisions, eastern, middle, and western division was constructed, and that's the 184 miles from Georgetown to Cumberland, Maryland. American-born engineer Benjamin Wright designed and oversaw the project. Uh, Benjamin Wright is known as the father of American civil engineering. He was the chief engineer for the Erie Canal, and he was brought down here by the president of the canal company, Charles Fenton Mercer, and, um, and he brought all his boys with him, his contractors, his engineers, and he was a lawyer, he was a country lawyer that taught himself engineering. And up until that point, there were no American engineers. All, all canals were done by uh, foreign engineers. A big obstacle to the completion of the canal was getting the boats across the Monocacy River. So work on an aqueduct was begun right away. First of all, you need cut stone. And the stone would be hand-hewn from the quarry and then uh, would be hauled down here, usually by oxen or horse. There was a tramway, a horse-drawn tramway that extended from the quarry down here. In the wintertime, sometimes they used sleds when there was snow. They also used this Monocacy River and boats to, to bring it down here. And there would have been a wood structure built first, right at, adjacent to the aqueduct. And the structure, they would have brought the stone out. And through the use of gin poles, they would have pulled the stone over and laid it into place. Because the structure had to stand in the water, a special cement was brought here from Shepherdstown, Virginia. Hydraulic cement is a natural cement that will set underwater. Essentially, hydraulic cement is um, natural limestone with a high clay content, which is burned at a higher temperature, and then it's ground. The mill that produced the hydraulic cement for the Monocacy Aqueduct also milled flour. <laughs> so we go for like four months doing cement and then four months doing flour. And most of the stonemasons who worked on the aqueduct were Welsh, English, and Scottish. This sketch shows the layout of the construction area. We do have a map from 1830 that ind ind indicates the site. 
And over in, which is now woods, would have been the contractor's camp. And they, they would have been pretty much huts. But on the map, there was a stone tavern. And in fact, the superintendent of uh, masonry um, really deplored the, the fact that the workers spent most of their time <laughs> drinking. <laughs> the Monocacy Aqueduct was completed in 1833. At first, it moved flour and wheat to Georgetown. When the CNO reached Cumberland in 1850, it became primarily a coal carrier. Cumberland coal was considered some of the finest in the nation. During the Civil War, the CNO Canal was an important transportation corridor for the Union Army. As such, its many parts were vulnerable. This aqueduct was attacked twice in the um, days just before the Battle of Antietam. Lee was moving north uh, toward Antietam and in, he was going to try to move into Pennsylvania. He sent um, at two different times, uh, two different generals to destroy this particular aqueduct. And in both cases, they, uh, the, uh, they failed. In the first case, the, um, their tools weren't, sh weren't heavy enough to drill into the aqueduct, make holes to put the black powder in, and um, they had to pull out within a matter of hours. Um, and in the second case, a lock keeper at Lock 27, which is just south of here at Sphinx, Sphinx Ferry, talked General Hill, Confederate General Hill, out of destroying this aqueduct um, and instead what they did was they destroyed Lock 27. War was one threat, Mother Nature another. In 1924, the CNO Canal was abandoned. A flood had destroyed some parts and fixing it wasn't worth it. By then, the railroad had surpassed it as a profitable means of transport. But the Monocacy Aqueduct endured and became a spot popular with picnickers and boaters alike. The federal government acquired the CNO Canal in 1938, and in 1971, it became a national park. One year later, the Monocacy Aqueduct sustained the worst damage of its 170 years. It was completely submerged by Hurricane Agnes. Soon after, wooden scaffolding was erected to stabilize the structure. In 1996, the National Park Service began the process of rehabilitating the Monocacy Aqueduct. The $6 million project received a lot of public support. On May 21, 2005, a newly restored aqueduct was rededicated, preserving this graceful reminder of our country's early engineering triumphs for generations to come. If we were to lose this aqueduct like we lost several other aqueducts along the canal, would break the continuity of the park and it would be much less uh, useful to us at a time when we're going through an incredible period of urbanization. Besides an impressive aqueduct, this area in northwestern Montgomery County holds countless historical treasures to visit and enjoy. Just down the road from here off Route 109, there's a tiny little town known as Bellsville. There you can find a very special cemetery and chapel. The Monocacy Cemetery is a cemetery like most others. There are rolling hills, shady trees, and headstones of all shapes, sizes, and ages. 
But if you look closely, you will notice a lot of southern iron crosses next to many of the graves. Linda Kelly Atwell is the president and founder of the newly reactivated E.V. White Chapter number 1360 of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. This area is called Billsville, and it's right outside of Poolsville. And most of the soldiers buried in the cemetery are the, uh, were in Company B of the Elijah Veers White 35th Battalion Virginia Cavalry. Now the commander, Colonel E.V. White, or Elijah Veers White, was a native of Poolsville. And he originally went down into Virginia and started out, I think, in the 1st Virginia Cavalry. And shortly thereafter, he started his own command and most of the people who lived around here then went and joined him. When they died, their bodies were brought back to Poolsville. This marker lists the names of white soldiers who are buried here. 32 names are on the tablet, but close to 40 Confederate soldiers are interred here. This site was a cemetery well before the Civil War. St. Peter's Parish began burying people on this land in the 1700s. It's believed that the original chapel was one of the earliest places of worship in the county. And during the uh, War for Southern Independence, the Union Army held this area uh, because it was high ground and they could do their signaling from here. And so they came into the chapel and they occupied it. They put the horses in underneath the roof and they took out the sides and the pews and the floor and they burnt that for firewood. They destroyed it because they didn't want to leave it here so that the Confederate Army, who was camped nearby, could use it. In 1915, a new structure was built by a group of Poolsville women interested in preserving the memories of the Confederacy. They were a new club at the time. Well, after the original chapel was burnt down during the, the war, uh, there was nothing here to protect the people during a, a funeral. And so the United Daughters of the Confederacy, the Elijah Veers White, known as the E.V. White Chapter, here in Maryland, decided to build a memorial slash mortuary chapel to protect the people who were here during burials. And they would actually hold services here in the chapel, and it was also used to for protection for people to get out of the weather. The inside is sparsely decorated with items donated by the early chapter members. Portraits of Generals Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson flank an original stained glass mural. To the right, a glass bookcase holds chapter records. An organ, which no longer works today, is off to the side next to several rows of simple wooden pews. Today the chapel is rarely open to the public. It's used occasionally for meetings of the reactivated E.V. White chapter. For more information about that chapter, visit their website at www.rootsweb.com forward slash tilde M-D-E-V-W-U-D-C. So, have you figured out the answer to this month's history mystery? These notches were worn into the aqueduct's railing by tow ropes. Mules walked along the towpath, pulling the boats behind them. Their rope kept rubbing the curved portion of this railing, and the notches were formed. Well, that's all the time we have for this show. If you have comments for us or ideas for future shows, send an email to paths-present at comcast.net. Be sure to tune in again next time as Paths to the Present looks at Montgomery County's nationally recognized agricultural reserve, which is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. See you then.